And we're live. Oh, well, hello, everybody. It is 2020 1007, episode 25. You're listening to Lucid Indifference. That's lucidindifference.com. Well, I think we should get something out of the way, which is we need an intro. We need an intro to let people know what we're about, what we're like, what they can expect, all this kind of goodness. We've had a lot of episodes where I open with Administrivia. It's not particularly interesting. <laughs> I'm doing it again right now, but I swear I'm going to make this one interesting. So uh, we had the idea of taking a bunch of clips from earlier and trying to pull them together, make them nice and tight, and give them as, an, an, as a bit of an introduction to the sorts of content that might be expected, even though we don't have any kind of plan whatsoever. I may, might have some bullet points. At best, I might. I might. So, so what can I say? So I'm Sai, and this is my minion, Minion. Say hi, Minion. Hello. Smooth Brain, say hi. Hi. <laughs> See what I have to work with. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I bought this guy from Romani Slavers, and he never really worked out. I've been trying to housebreak him, but Floor's oh man, again. it's rough. Okay, I mean, the other day, the other day he comes to me and he's like, so what's all this about this blue water? Like, he's got stained blue lips and I'm thinking, well, maybe he got some of that fancy blue Gatorade and, or maybe he got into the Kool-Aid or something like that. Not the right kind of Kool-Aid because that would make life a little bit easier just not having him around, so to speak. But uh, apparently he's never seen blue toilet water before. Never. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, he's kind of like been sheltered for a long, long time. Like, okay, well, you know, I have to explain that it's just like the urinal pucks that he eats. It's just blue and it goes into the back of the toilet. And <laughs> so, so, I mean, every once in a while, you know, ah. Uh, uh, he amuses me. That's why I keep him around, but he's not actually useful for anything. So uh, we'll work on that. Won't we minion? Minion. Say yes. I was You're not even there. Are you? I was facing a corner for a brief moment. Do, do you have your co conical hat on? No. <laughs> we need to get you one for Halloween. Not like a white conical one, because that could be misinterpreted, but uh, like gray or something. You're not, you're not like a proper, <laughs> you're not even a proper dunce. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, what can I say about myself and what you can expect out of my head? Um, I mean, these days I write in my spare time. I took a break from that to do this podcast stuff. Uh, I like business. I like personal improvement, stuff like that. I've been through a lot of nonsense in my life and I try to learn from it. So... I can uh, explain a lot of those stories. Uh, I like interpreting things like what game companies are up to these days, stuff like this. And I like to listen to other people to talk about these things, even though I no longer have a business. I'm not in the business of giving business advice, so to speak. Um, my background is everything from technical support, including outright education, to documentation, to you know, all this kind of stuff. I've been one of those nerd techie types I've been a Linux guy for a long time. Uh, I got better, but not really because Windows is still too dumb and too hard to do stuff. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. So uh, the podcasting thing is an interesting experience for me to both learn how any of this works. And I keep getting told that I have a nice voice. I don't believe people, but I'm getting, I'm getting used to it. I'm getting used to it. Um, and Minion, um, what are you good for anyway? What are you... <laughs> Why would anybody listen to you? I'm totally keeping this dead air in. I have no clue at this point. Okay, so let, let's dig into this. <laughs> now, I've already gone through a whole lot of personal life advice, but I've never talked about goal setting or planning or knowing yourself or any of this kind of stuff. And, uh, I've tried with minion kind of as a hobby for my amusement. Really. I basically gave up several times. Uh, but, uh, I mean, uh, how do I explain it? There's a self-improvement version of an angel investor, which I was several times over for him. And none of that works out 
because there's a drive that happens in a person. But it's not one of those, you know, those idiots that run up on a stage and they're like, you can do it. I've complained about this stuff before. There's a version of that. There's kind of a, I mean, it's not going to be a fire in some people, in a lot of people. And and you'll notice that's the sort there. Introverted is the term we'll generally use, generally use but it's something like shy. And this sort will, um, they're, they're buffeted about like a balloon in the wind. And there is something like a, a person can create their own anchor and can kind of toss it in a direction. They can kind of paddle. And that's how a person can gently push towards things that end up mattering more. Too many people, they wait for certain events to happen and then they make a choice out of the choices that are presented to them. And that, that might be just fine. And I'd be happy with that if, if a lot of people were, but that's the thing. Most people aren't given those choices because the world doesn't work like that. So most of the time, what you need to do is, uh, the embarrassment is when you talk to other people about what you want in life, you end up kind of holding yourself accountable to it. It's really useful. If you're almost at the stage when, and it's, it's embarrassing just enough and you get motivated like that, like some people work pretty well like that. But if you're nowhere, anywhere near that, there's a version of embarrassment when you're too shy to admit that you want something to yourself. And that's, what's weird is nobody cares because nobody can hear your own thoughts. I mean, maybe, Maybe it will come across in your art that you're all brooding in this kind of stuff. But I mean, artists are, uh, they're an entirely different problem. So Minion, you're not an artist. I've never seen you do anything like creative <laughs> with, with anything ever. Um, and you don't seem to be mechanical. So some people, what they'll do is they'll see uh, procedures outside themselves and they'll be able to pull them apart like building blocks and then arrange them for themselves so they, they don't exactly have the imagination to invent these things themselves, but they can arrange them and follow processes and stuff like that. And they can make their dream, whatever it happens to be, come to life by taking the best of what's available. And there's a lot that's out there. So I, I've always had the impression from you because I've owned Minion for like not quite a decade. And, uh, he's never like, I, it, it, I mean, there are, okay. So there are like union rules about owning a minion and there are certain things that you can and can't do blah, blah rules. I mean, the olden days and like the 1700s was like the, the best, <laughs> but we're not, oh, well, I know wax about, about the olden days. So. Minion, uh, what usually what, a what people say, they say things like, uh, like you, you can't English is great for stuff like this. Okay. So you, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. So there's stuff like that, that applies to in either inspiration or mentoring or even education, where at some point it has to be internal. Like you have been told and you have obsessed over the phrase, uh, you have to learn to learn. Now, I, I think that's a, a useful thing for you to obsess over because in finding that solution, you will be achieving an enlightenment that uh, will be exceptionally valuable to you. So let's, let's see if I can explain learning to learn in your context. So it's the smoldering ember that a person has to build inside themselves and it's blowing on that to actually make a larger fire, to actually light other stuff on fire. You know, to, it doesn't matter if you pitch kindling on something, if the kindling is just going to be warm, it's not going to mean anything. You actually have to blow on the embers, get things caught properly on fire, etc. Now learning, the learning part, that first part has to do with your own personal momentum. Okay. And your momentum begins like a, a, a snowball rolling downhill, right? The, the notion is you, ha you have a mountain. If you pitch a little snowball down the hill, it will pick up snow as it goes until it becomes giant until, you know, it's like, 
it's going to crush ski lodges and all that kind of fun stuff. And so the, the learning part is about understanding how that, that operates in you and in the choices that you have and how the world works. So it would be making certain very long-term decisions about what you enjoy, what you appreciate, or uh, what would benefit you if you would persist them. So that, and that's the, uh, the idea of momentum. So I've often said, well, what do you like doing? And I could ask, well, why not put you on the spot right now? Ooh, you're going to hate this, this show. So if we looked at an average day of yours, what parts of that day, what slices of that day would be interesting to you? I'm not, I don't mean exciting or motivating or anything, just like better than the background hum of the, the, like the just constant, there's like a kind of breathing that people do where life is just kind of like, eh, it's a little bit this, it's a little bit that, but it doesn't mean anything. It's like going to work every day. It does, your life starts when you get home. So that stuff can be cut out. It can be filtered out of the idea of you enjoying life. <laughs> you're, you're, okay, obviously you're a slave for that, that part of your life, but for the free time that you get, um, what things actually rise above that general murky, obnoxious, pointless life that we all have a, 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 a part of all of our lives is like that. Like we serve others in order to get money to buy food and stuff like this. So for you, if you think about your life, if you look at a, at a week, let's say for example, an average week where nothing exciting is happening, no, no new events are blowing you around and you were to filter out all the samey same stuff, uh, stuff that doesn't really matter. What's the stuff in your life that you find most interesting? I'm not hearing you. I press it and then let go. I had the thought and then it just and then it turned into nothing. Um other than there are times where I just do multiplayer game <clears throat> games so that I can interact with people. Okay. Um is the only thing I can think of that stands out. And then we just have fun conversations or just do stuff and then mix with a little bit of person. I just make things interesting as your things just get interesting as activities go on. So somewhere in there is um how how would I how would I make fun of you? Uh okay. There is so we, we used to have a concept called the couch potato and that hasn't been mapped properly over to the, the digital age the, where there is the notion that there are slices of your free time that, that belong to you, but a person consumes a lot of that time with the, uh, because I've talked about the problems of the poor uh, spending a, a lot, a significant amount of money on luxury goods, luxury including things like eating out. And I don't mean going out to dine, I mean fast food. That's a luxury. Now, there's an equivalent for a person in their regular life where life sucks because, you know, it, it kind of does. If you don't have things handed to you, uh, it, life is kind of annoying and dumb. And the, the point, the point is not something that you get handed to you ever. 
And, and that's a lot of, that's a problem that a lot of people face is life is without a point, right? Which is why a lot of people find meaning in something collective, something shared, something given. Like, so um, the point becomes your family. The point becomes, and it becomes something about pursuing something that ends up in somebody else's hands or their head. And, um, but a, a lot of people, life is pointless. <laughs> Sorry for being Buddhist about this. Okay. So life is pointless and it's, and it's, there's enough of a kind of a suffering that exists throughout it that people take what free time they have. And just like a poor person spending on luxury goods as a way of compensating for the challenges of life of being poor, a person who's got a relatively uninteresting life spends a lot of that free time on the luxury good of entertainment. And, but entertainment doesn't do anything just like going and eating fast food. It doesn't do anything. You're not really building memories because that would be the important thing. If you want to go to a restaurant, it's, it's still a luxury, but you have the opportunity of building solid memories or of being with people or all, all this kind of stuff there. But it is still a luxury, just to make it clear. There's the, the AAA video game experience, which is, it's a luxury. You can just play old games if you wanted to, play cheaper games, wait for games that are on sale, but you're splurging. You, you could eat at home, right? You could, you could still play games, but they can be all your old stuff, all the stuff, right? So games are still possible, but you're, you're spending the luxury and your time you're spending on something that is, um, it's still not doing anything. Okay. Now within that, you were talking about, well, talking with other people. Okay. So, um, I'm of the general opinion that this is, this is one of the more important things a person can do. Obviously I'm doing it now. Okay. Because everything that you do and everything that you like, it, it comes to nothing unless it somehow escapes you. And usually that happens without your permission because you're interacting with other people and a little bit of your personality is imprinted out into the world, on, into all these other people that you don't, not necessarily have a conversation with, but that you interact with in whatever manner. So in the, in the context of a video game, you end up being highly constrained. Okay, so... I'll bring this one up. So Minion, in a previous episode, you talked about this same thing. And uh, what you were saying was that um, I, I expanded the notion by saying that there is a kind of disposability that happens when you have access to enough interchangeable anonymous players, even if they have a voice attached. You can just get rid of one and pick up another one. So if you have a, a poorly performing teammate, you can just, you know, go on, pick up the next one. And if that's made convenient, and it tends to be quite convenient, that tends to be the fundamental underlying group mechanics of a lot of games now. And as soon as you can interchange people like that, uh, it first off, it dehumanizes them. So every new person that you get in contact with becomes less and less important less of a person. Okay. So in, in all honesty, minion, there's a big difference between play, well, playing video games as luxury and interacting with people and actually saying that that's really particularly interesting. Cause I mean, there are some friends that you have kind of online. Uh, do you have long-term fruitful conversations with people that are more strongly your friends than other just randos? Yes. So, um, this, however, doesn't give you anything. Not really. It doesn't build you anything. doesn't make you anything. I know there's a lot of people who are the, they're the extroverted sort, but they're the, the highly social and they quote unquote build relationships. And, uh, that's, that's wonderful and all, but that's not really what's happening. If you're just goofing around with a video game relationship building, 
I don't even know how people these days are going to be able to do it, being mostly mostly stuck apart, uh, very, very separate because you can't communicate properly. And like I said, you can't build really meaningful, connected, long-term relationships because you're forced to be in close proximity with the same people. Uh, you don't get that online. You just swap people around. Like uh, I had the kindergarten comment. If, if uh, no, it was the recess argument, pardon me, the recess argument with kids stuck at home who are doing online education, which the entire, like between you, me, and the entirety of civilization, we know that education isn't about educating. We know that it's about imprinting culture and it's about socialization. And that's not happening online. <laughs> Learning math online, okay, you can do that, but that's not the important stuff about, you know, kin what would it be called, K-12? So kindergarten through grade 12. So we're talking about like five years old to 18, kind of thing. So that experience, it, it becomes more academic later. But honestly, it's really important to develop social skills. And socializing is about being forced to be in long-term contact with the same people over uh, enough time that there are consequences for interacting poorly. And some of this is, it's just human instinct. So the consequence of insulting somebody, that'll stick for however many months or possibly years. And that, that is a learning experience that's, that's imprinted into uh, a youth, a student, so to speak. And that's being eroded, like that's being completely eroded because the idea of learning online is just the the ones and zeros of the academia is going to be all there. That's fine. Maybe kids will be incredible students. That That's not true, <laughs> but some of them, sure. But they're not going to get that forced, uh, that proximity effect because they're allowed to spend time with other people. They're allowed to walk away. They're, they're not required to be on campus, so to speak. They're not required to be on the site of the school for their breaks, for their in-between classes, for their, right, for their entire school day. They're not with the same people. And so there's a kind of erosion of the, uh, the efficacy, the human bonding. So being online and having the moderately, let's say, like the strong, let's say strong relationships online, strong friendships, uh, that okay, but that's not, that doesn't do anything. That doesn't get anything that doesn't, I mean, not to be selfish about it or anything like that, but again, that, that's all in, that's all right next door to luxury and it doesn't, it doesn't do anything, doesn't build anything. So this is just, uh, the coping mechanism for dealing with the general pointlessness, the background hum, the, you know, the fuzz, because you can have a brain on autopilot, like you're driving or something like that. And you've done it a million times. You got the reflexes in there in case something weird happens. But generally speaking, you turn your brain off. You don't have to remember how uneventful every single drive to work was. Your brain just goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did some driving. Don't care. And so you could do that with all of life and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I you know, whatever master made me maybe lick the toilet until I cut my tongue on it. Yeah, 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 whatever. And, and just kind of filter that out. And so minion, what are you left with it is like the exciting parts of life or just, yeah, I, I kind of chatted with somebody this one time. <laughs> like, I, honestly, I'll let you out to play. <laughs> it's like, you just have to tell me what you want to do. I, mean, I don't chain you up anymore. Wait, when this, wouldn't this, wouldn't this just be the equivalent of, let's say in your area, there's so many schools and you just take them like one week to this school, the next week to that school as he's going through every age sort of thing? Uh, that happens generally three times. So sometimes it's a kindergarten thing. And usually that, ent that entire class graduates out into another school. So it'll go, f so... Back in my day, we had multiple kindergartens 
and it would go then into a grade school, which would go to uh, grade six. Then there would be a seven, eight at another school. I don't know why. And then nine through, in, in my case, it was nine through 13. And, um, and we, we, it was an attached kindergarten to the grade school. So we all migrated because, uh, it, it's, uh, generally what happens is your parents will have their kids go to a nearby school. And then even though they graduate out of a kindergarten, they'll still go to another nearby school. All of them will tend to go to that same nearby school. So you'll, you'll keep the same, I mean, if you're six years old, okay, right. So they'll keep the same friends and stuff like that. And usually it's just an attached school. And then they, they, they break apart, right? So people will go to different junior high schools, which might be a separate place. And usually it is separate from a high school. And so you might, for example, I met people from grade school going into high school, but the two year difference means that I don't really care about them anymore. But yeah, yeah. So socialization ends up being constrained within the years that that, but I mean, just within one year is what I'm thinking. That's, that is important enough that you when you're in the same math class together every day, certain things matter. And when you're walking the same halls across crossing paths again and again, every day, uh, there is, there ends up being socialization that can't exist online. We have no concept of conveying any of that or even displaying it. Have we had documentaries or something at least? No. Movies? No. <laughs> no. So we have no way of actually imprinting this stuff online. It's going to be a big problem. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, but, uh, what? <laughs> So that you're derailing me, you're derailing me. Um, the yeah, uh, this is kind of on point, on topic. It's just another way of expressing it. Well, for you, the everything's online. Like your entertainment went online, and, it, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that because you did your socialization. Like you, like you grew up in Eastern Europe and all this kind of stuff. You were around kind of other slaves and this kind of stuff, that's fine. I mean, that's good enough. But, uh, uh, so I, it's, it's not surprising that you're kind of like where you're at, <laughs> but, but I mean, now that you're an adult and you're there, there are different constraints. You're still choosing the, to be involved in a luxury instead of something else that's more meaningful. And so the argument is, well, you just have to wait until you bump into the right thing and then that will speak to you and then you'll know and you, that will somehow kindle a fire in you that you never thought you had and it will be the... I don't it, think that'll happen. Because it doesn't. Like, it won't. It's like... Um, so the, jo the joke, the problem is it's actually serious. Is so um, Hollywood... It's a place where there's lots of filming and people who, who are like, well, I want to be an actor. So they go through all this stuff. They pay a bunch of con artists to teach them some skills and they go, they end up waiting tables for years, trying to get their name out there, trying to get their big break. Right. Um, and a lot of people are kind of like that. They're, they're living their life and they're waiting to get their big break. They're waiting for that, that one person to, to hand pick them out, that, that, the kind, the equivalent of an angel investor for a person's purpose in life, just a, you know, Hey, this, have you tried this? Like, oh, that's what I was waiting for. And, and the thing is, huh, how, how do I put this minion? You've had that chance multiple times, except, except nothing, right? Except, and you'll say, well, I'd like to do this and I'll go, okay, sure. <laughs> Okay, I'll snap my fingers and make that happen. It's not a big deal. Okay. Time passes. Where are you? Shrug. Okay. So it isn't that uh that the opportunities aren't there. It's that even when the opportunities are there, uh maybe too much of your interest is being spent on luxury and not enough is on that ability to pounce on opportunities. So like maybe it will be that you will go through all of your entire life and never experience 
uh, a drive external to yourself that somehow converts you into a believer of some purpose that makes you drop all the other un unimportant stuff in life and and do do a thing. Right? That's probably the case for most people. So it it has to be something like you have to make yourself ready so that when you see an opportunity that is probably going to be good enough, you will pounce on it without needing some sort of outside fuel because you got nothing else. You got nothing better to do, so to speak. You got your, the rest of your time is being spent on, on, uh, diminishing the, the woes of the rest of existence, right? So what you would need to do is take some of that luxury, diminish that and replace that with this, the hope of taking advantage of that opportunity. So like I said about something like this podcast, I find it strange when you don't say it's me. I mean, not just because I know I'm awesome, but because it's the only other thing other in your background hum, other than your luxury good that has any pot potential whatsoever. So the, the, the question becomes whether or not you can find some avenue in the podcast experience that you can latch on to that can make it more important, more urgent than the actual, than the, the luxury, like a video game stopped. Uh, actually that's probably not a good direction to go in. Don't worry. Video games are going to continue on. Sorry. Probably gave you a panic attack there. I'm going to keep the internet connection going. Don't worry. It'll, it'll all be good. Um, but, uh, yeah, where was I? My train of thought got, got damaged. Hang on. Okay. So the, the opportunity is right now you're sitting in on an opportunity that you could choose to pursue because it's better than everything else you've got to do. Really? Because what, 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 like, are you busy? <laughs> Are you busy right now? Hey, you got this opportunity. Yeah, just go ahead. I mean, honestly, it's okay. So, so I can, I can handhold you about a lot of stuff. I just happen to be far more effective, which I'll totally talk about in segment three. I just happen to be far more effective than anybody, anybody shy of one of these high functioning autistic types at just picking up new stuff and figuring it out and, and learning it and just having fun learning. I love doing that kind of stuff. I don't know why. Um, so, and you don't. So your, uh, your kind of what I would say that you have to do is you have to sacrifice some of your luxury and spend it on doing something, even if it's boring or hard, anything else. And when there is an opportunity in front of you, just do that. Cause it's not like you have any other choices. You're not making them yourself. You don't have some inspiration already in you that said, Oh, well, I always wanted to be an astronaut. And, and at least you can be like, well, okay, that's, that's a mountain you can go and find. At least you don't have that. So at least just the stuff that's in front of you and see and pursue it a little bit. And then when pursuing it a little bit, you gain the skill of learning how to pursue. Okay. And when you learn how to pursue and you're like, oh, but you pursued it a little bit and you're like, well, if you can explain why you don't like something, if you can't explain why you don't like something, just keep doing it anyway. Cause what else you got <laughs> when you get something else? Okay. Try that too. Then you can compare the two things and you can learn which one is better than the other at least. And even if you don't like the other one, if, if it's better do that for a little while until the next opportunity and the next opportunity, and you need to to pursue things like that. So right now, what else you got on your plate? Like you don't really want to talk about some of the other stuff that you'd like to do because it would be too embarrassing, but like, um, the, the equivalent of doing like streaming or this kind of stuff is, I mean, get a taste of it and I'll help you with that. 
we can shelf the podcast if you really wanted to. I'll probably just continue it on my own. And if if you find something else that is that actually drives you that that is better than the luxury of the actual video games, something that actually matters to you, then absolutely like you pursue anything else. And uh so yeah, yeah, so oh my do not disturb is actually working. How nice. But of course I have glanced over at my phone. Um, okay. So yeah, I, w- one of the problems with the podcasting thing is I have no way of actually helping you talk and I'm perfectly competent at just talking for forever. So what I would like you to pursue is to have a few bullet points of stuff that's on your mind as you come across it through your life. So between now and next show, so next Sunday, um, see if you can write down three bullet points of something that's cool, some story you want to share, something like this. Um, And then what we'll do is we'll, I will pause and and, uh, bring one of those things up and actually engage you on, um, engage you on those topics and see how much I can draw out of you. Because those will end up being your little, the blips, the little high points, something you want to share. So write down a a few things of something, like one thing a day of something that's interesting that you'd like to talk about. And see if you can remember it for a few days until the next show. And And then you can have that and look forward to doing the same talking that you do, and but doing the same talking on a podcast. And that will actually make better use of you using all the skills you still have that you say you kind of like. So can you do that? Can you work with me? I'll try. (laughs) Wow. Okay. Yoda would absolutely hate you. Um, I don't know if you could hear my phone just chime. I've got do not disturb on, but I also have certain apps that seem to be able to penetrate through that. I don't know how that's possible. I will, I made a note already and I will explore that. I actually have a, I actually have a notifications blocker program that seems to be able to give me notifications through, through that, through do not disturb. And, uh, it is conflicting with another one, a, a notification. It's like a nag feature. So if I miss a text, I don't just want to hear the text once. I want to come back five minutes later and have my phone keep trying to nag me so that I, cause I don't come down and I check my phone every time I'm away from it. I'm not tethered to it. Um, and so I have that software. So some combination of stuff. And I only learned this just as the show was starting. So I'm like, do I turn my phone off? Eh, That should be okay. But no, but no, actually it was a, a collision of three separate events, which is extremely rare. Rare. You know, I got two texts and a phone call. (laughs) Go figure. Right at this time. Don't you, wouldn't you put your phone on silence or vibration only mode? That's what it's on, but it doesn't seem to matter. That is what I was just explaining. So there's a do not disturb mode unless I misunderstand what do not disturb means. I think you're misunderstanding what it does because my phone, I can, there's a setting where it just vibrates or can vibrate with sound. Yes. So I have a do not disturb mode, which is, you know, don't allow any calls. Don't allow any messages. (laughs) Right. And, uh, I don't think it's working as intended as I thought. Exactly. That's, that's what I was just saying. So what I'm going to do is a combination of airplane mode and do not disturb. That way it just doesn't, it doesn't talk to the outside world. Quote unquote, doesn't talk to the outside world. It, it, uh, it won't pester me about the stuff that it's trying to do. And that should work out. Um, so I've got this, this setup checklist, which I'm actually going to write a note in there right this very second. So Let's see where I have a note. I'm going to clickety clack and then edit this out in post. Done. Okay. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll also put this in do not disturb so that 
I don't want to turn my phone off because that's what I was thinking of doing. Uh, because when I turn it back on again, I have to open up all my browser tabs and have them uh, all recached so that I can, I have a bunch of songs that I just have in tabs in my browser. And uh, yeah, I, I want to be able to like walk away from home with it and not have to use uh, data to get the songs again. And I've been too lazy just to download the music. I'm going to figure that out at some future point. Uh, right now, the f I'm not interested in the phone. So uh, at some future point, I'm going to be interested in it again, uh, but not for not for a little while. I've got some other stuff. I'm totally interested in audio engineering, in, in actual like real world physical acoustic treatment and stuff like that is what I've been getting into. But uh, we'll, we'll, I will totally nerd out over all that stuff a little bit later. It'll be, it'll be the it'll be the best. Um, so before the break, I guess I'll round things off with, uh, I think it's, it should be obvious that I'm in a better mood and that doesn't necessarily mean that I would have a lot to talk about, but I can certainly conversationally jazz off of whatever, including myself. Uh, cause it's not like Minion can help me. God, can't even help himself. Um, so, and that is, uh, that's partly because I decided to give up on the crackers that might've been a problem. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give up on carbs. I did pick up something. There's a concept called a carb blocker. It's not really, it doesn't really work like that as such. And claims like that, uh, you're not going to find on bottles. So it's a little bit weird to understand this. So first there is actual science behind this. So I've got a bottle of this stuff. What it is, is it's an extract from white kidney bean. And I know, I know, cause I'm the sort, I would look at this and go, oh wow, it's, it's this woo, this nonsense. It's just being sold. Okay. But that's, that's actually not true. So the, um, I don't, I don't understand this topic well enough. So, oh man, why'd they have to make the text so small? So the thing about this substance is there's a metabolism that exists that that's specific to carbohydrates. So there's a, like an enzymatic digestion thing that happens with carbs and this stuff reduces that. It doesn't eliminate that. And it also, um, it yeah, performs magic. Anyhow, I'm experimenting with that stuff because apparently I like experimenting with taking pills. I don't know where that came from, but I'll try to, I'll try to manage that. So I'll totally talk about that problem that I just exhibited there. Um, so I've got the kidney bean extract that'll help with carbs, but I'm not going to eliminate carbs from my diet. I actually did go keto. I've talked about that before. I went lion and I did all this kind of stuff. Uh, that isn't what matters. It's bacon that matters. It's the combination of not eating. I think it's gluten and eating bacon of <laughs> all. Well, Oh, I hate bacon. At least I got better bacon because the other bacon. Min I sent Minion out to get bacon and the bacon he came back with because he's incompetent was just awful. <laughs> it's just awful. And I had just had to stop. Even though I needed bacon, I actually ate some of the bacon even though I needed it, right? Because I, I can't not do that. So I think you were just having a laugh and I'll pay you back one day for... I, okay, I mean, I probably deserved it but you're not at a position in life where you can, you can, uh, level some sort of karmic vengeance on me of all people. And so the other stuff uh, that I got is, uh, I was talking, I had talked about headaches and then I thought about it being problems with dehydration specifically mm -hmm. while sleeping. And also it just, if for whatever reason you're urinating a lot, what happens in your body is whenever you urinate, specifically of any sort at any time for any reason, there's always going to be a loss of uh, potassium and magnesium specifically, but also a little bit of sodium. And these are the sorts of things that you would sweat out as well. And this is why, so if you're a long, if you're in, in long-term physicality, so like a long distance runner or something like that, and it's like four hours, if you don't do electrolyte replacement, you're probably going to have some really serious problems and pass out and this kind of stuff. 
And so there's this is where energy drinks come from, like sports drinks. So the Gatorade thing. So electrolytes, it's nothing special, right? It's it's just potassium and magnesium and some salt. And the thing is, I got some pills for this, uh, and I had talked about this last show where Minion's like, well, I should just get some Gatorade. Okay, yeah, well, that's a nice, that's nice, right? That, except I would just be drinking Gatorade and I would just be done because I would have drunk it all. And pills are, it's a more clinical thing to do. And so what I'm doing is I'm before, a little bit before bed, you know, an hour before bed, when you shower, I'll take one of these on an empty stomach in my case. And the idea is if it, there needs to be something that happens to you. So first off, so you, you need to replenish the stuff that you're peeing out. Um, and you also need to make sure that your body doesn't do that so much. So drinking something like a diuretic, like alcohol or anything with caffeine is going to cause your body to be a poorer storer of water. And so if you drink a bunch of coffee and stuff before bed, coffee actually makes me tired for other reasons. And so there's, there's effects from the coffee that will defeat the, the caffeine effect. And it can, it'll make any, a lot of people will get tired depending on how much they drink. So it's a combination of making sure that in the later half of the day, you're not doing anything with caffeine and having a little bit of electrolytes so that you replenish anything that you might be urinating out. And I will totally get into in the next segment after the break, how there's a more clinical way of doing this and saving a crazy amount of money rather than buying a pill. And there's a whole lot of stuff that you could do rather than taking pills. And, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this specific problem. So let's, uh, let's take a break slightly early and be back in, I think it's 12 minutes now. I'll see you then. And we're back. Well, hello everybody. This is 2020-1007, episode number 25, second segment. Okay, so I was last talking about taking uh, electrolyte pills as a way of kind of helping reclaim some of what's in my body uh, because of, you know, if you nap, so for example, for me, if I nap, I will tend to urinate when I get up. And it could be a 20 minute nap or something like that. That tends to happen. That happens a lot. And that's a, a really significant problem, right? And if, if you get up to pee and you go to bed, right? Go back to bed in the middle of the night and you get up again and you do it again, you're, you could drink water in between and, and that's important. However, you've still lost substances in you. And so if you ever do research on hangover cures and stuff like this, the hangover, it's exactly the same sort of problem that's happening in you. There's also stuff because that, because it just turns out that there's a lot of things that converge when you're, when you're interested in one thing. Okay. So this boy, does this not apply to a lot of people? So this won't apply to minion, but so when I research something, I get highly interested in it. And then I switch to the next thing and the next thing. And it just goes on. And there are these curious little loops that happen. So I was researching this stuff and I, and I dropped right back into keto research because apparently, so there's something called the keto flu, which happens for all kinds of reasons. But one of the reasons it happens is for the similar, for a similar reason as how, why hangovers are so awful. It's, it's something very similar happening in the body at one point, apparently. And so it was one keto guy that was talking about, uh, electrolytes. Now, I, the, these pills, they're expensive, uh, but the stuff I got, it's not just expensive, but I got it because it had some fancy numbers, but it gave a hundred pills and you only need one a day. Okay. So you can think about the cost as not being monthly, which was what a lot of the bottles are for everything else. Uh, but this is buying it every three months. So it's not so bad. So it's actually in more, it's, it's cost effective. It's cheaper than its competition. So its competition might be, so this is what, 50? It's, this is 50 Canadian dollars. The competition might be 40, 35. And a lot of people gravitate towards those. They'll be like, oh, that one gives me 120 pills for only $45. I'll take that one. But that one's two pills a day. 
And so I was looking at that and I'm thinking to myself, well, what are electric electrolytes? Like what's going on here? It, why it's being sold as products and stuff like that in pre-mixed energy drinks. And I, I happen to get it in, in pill form and it's being uh, sold in like powder form too. And I'm thinking to myself, well, yeah, what's in it? And, and can I make it? Can't I make it? Like this is, uh, okay. So I did a little research from this one keto guy and a couple of other people until I understood the topic well. And this nonsense, the cost, how much money is replaced by two ingredients, two ingredients that are trivial to go and get. The first is salt, just salt, just regular table salt. If you got iodized table salt, that's fine. Uh, if you want to be fancy, you can go and buy magic sea salt or something like that. Uh, if it makes you feel better, sure. No, it doesn't matter. Uh, the next is some is potassium. Now, uh, I don't mean bananas, like lots and lots of bananas. And maybe people that eat a st stuff like that, that's why they're doing better than, than they were before, because they had problems with potassium, possibly magnesium. And there's, there's this thing about people who do a lot of working out. I can't remember which order it is. So there are cramp problems when significantly working out. And it's, if you're cramping during a workout, it's one thing. And if you're cramping after the workout, it's another thing. One of them is a potassium uh, deficiency and the other is a magnesium deficiency. So, and there are, there are th ways to deal with that kind of thing. Could just be diet, but there are, there are pills you can take. So if, if you learn that you are deficient and you get cramps in one of these, uh, at one of these points, and it's just one of these points, then you know you're deficient in a very specific thing. That's just a way of, of knowing the science is good for that. Cause you know, cause we have the Olympic games and we've got a lot of very serious, we got a lot of professionally serious people about working out and we've got a lot of very serious hobbyists. So they, they care a lot. So there's a lot of, uh, investigation for this stuff. Uh, at any rate, at any rate, yeah. Potassium. Well, where do you get potassium from? As it turns out, uh, a, a quote unquote pure source of potassium, you can get something called, um, potassium bitartrate or cream of tartar cream of tartar. You can get at whatever the heck grocery store it's common and it's cheap. It's very cheap. And how much do you need for like one drink? I don't know, like not even a tablespoon, like not even a level tablespoon, less than that half. And that's going to last you a long time. And that's for one drink. How many are you going to drink a day? One. And you're done. And that's it. So sodium from salt, potassium from cream of tartar. That's your electrolyte drink. That's it. So yeah. Okay. So it's a $50 lesson this time. Okay. It's a $50 lesson. I will go and I will buy those ingredients. I will, I will, I will go through for a few months of this particular thing. I might end up taking more than one a day, depending on how I'm feeling. So if I, if, if I might have a, an electrolyte thing, that's why I've got the headaches, this kind of stuff. Right. So I might take more of this. If I'm going to, before I go to bed, I'll take one. If I take a nap, I'll probably take one beforehand, this kind of stuff. I'm already, already feeling better. And it's been a couple of days, but whenever you're doing something, don't, play pretend like, uh, what you did immediately solved it because it could have been any number of other things that I've done recently that have made me feel better, less headachey. Um, I may have to give up uh, diet Pepsi. I may have to give up a lot of caffeine, but I'm being told things like, well, coffee has these benefits. Like, uh, sounds like something, a uh, something <laughs> sounds like a sponsored message to me. I don't know about that. Uh, but apparently there is stuff. Uh, I just, uh, I hope not because I hate coffee too. Oh my God. Um, but, uh, so, and green tea is all the rage, which I hate green tea as well. So uh, my life's going to stink. Um, I can't get the green tea that I like. Maybe I'll get like, I'll have a, a tea ritual with matcha, matcha, matcha. Anyhow. Um, so yeah, that's making your own electrolytes. I'm going to actually link in the description to that particular video. 
and make sure you check that out. Uh, it's a great presentation on it. It's really simple stuff and uh, you don't have to be fancy about it. So, uh, I, I, okay. Halloween, I haven't really participated with in a long time. You know, as an adult, I don't, I don't do the dress up parties or anything like that. It's not really my thing. And, uh, I, I've never been the guy that sits on my, that sits waiting for people to ring my bell to hand out candy and this kind of stuff. But I want to make it different this year. And I want to make it different because I am deeply concerned about the damage to, to lives, to the culture of children, uh, by this the event and, and Halloween being, uh, scary, particularly scary to parents. And I'm not going to diminish any of those concerns, but uh, I do want to support the people that are brave that do do this. So I am, I already got a bunch of candy and I already put them like in little mesh bags and I'm, I'm totally ready to go, totally ready to go. And I wanted to get a mask and just have a mask. Not really. I don't really know what I'm going to do with anything. I'm not going to do anything fancy. So I got like a jester mask. And it's, it's awesome. So I, I got it because the other mask that I ordered, um, it's, it's delayed for mysterious reasons. It's really weird because it's being shipped from one part of Canada and it's just coming across the other part of Canada. But for some reason it got caught in customs in the other part of Canada. It's like, I'm not, I'm not sure how this one's working out, but yeah, it's, and it's not too far away. It's... <laughs> But so we have really good transportation across this country, even though it's huge. And so it's, this is a particularly strange problem. I might still get the, my mask of preference before Halloween, but if I don't, I, I made sure that I ordered this other one. It's already here. I had already tinkered, tinkered with it. I don't want to talk about it now. I'm not going to link to it or anything like that, but, um, okay. So the, the thing is, uh, it's one of these made in China things, of course. Right. And it's so it's one size fits all, which means it won't fit. <laughs> so, so I knew that I knew that going in, but I'm only going to wear it for a day. It's, it's fine. The thing is it, it's fairly heavy and it comes with two strings. It, it, they're not looped through holes in it or anything like that. They're just kind of glued into the side, which, which bothers me. But again, I'm only wearing it. Hopefully I can wear it more than once. I'll drill holes into it and mount it properly if I, if I care. Um, but so it's got two strings and you would think I'd lift it up to my face and I just tie like a bow on the back of my head somehow, like upside down and backwards with my hands, not being able to see it, this kind of stuff. And, uh, that can't work. That can't work unless I, maybe if I put my face down on a desk with it and then I can tie it properly. Um, but it's very heavy, so it will sag. And it's only got that string, and it's got a loop for you to hang it on a wall because it's technically supposed to be a piece of art and happens to be a mask that you can wear, but it's really a piece of art first. And it's actually really pretty. I, I, Maybe I would put that on camera maybe next year if, if we do the filming stuff. So I decided that I would research my problem because remember what I've said before, when you have a problem and you suspect that other people have had that problem, look into it, look into it and use your bad words until you figure out the language to use. And so I learned about something called a slip knot and it's not the band. It's a certain kind of knot that you can, that you can tie. And the thing about it is I learned it of all places from a woman who does kind of the arts and craftsy stuff for like handmade uh, bracelets and necklaces. And a slip knot is important so that the, the purchaser, the wearer can actually manipulate the length of the, let's say a bracelet so that it fits as well as they like. And so it will slip to become tighter or looser for their needs. And there is, and so what it is, is, is it's just a kind of a, a really weird perspective on uh, how you can line up two, two strings and wrap them together in certain ways, wrap one end 
over the middle of the other and wrap the other over the middle of the one and have it so that you can slide them in and out. And it worked great. It really paid off from me being rather annoyed that this probably, this too heavy, doesn't fit me right thing will just fall off my head to something that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's different because you have to know where to pull on the strings to actually slip it properly. But once I do it, it's on, it's great. I still might drill holes in it, even if they become obvious, I'd still drill holes on it and put like an elastic, something like this. Um, that would be a really good thing to do. And maybe it's, it's hanging on my door. So I, I will look at it. It will be a landmine that will remind me to investigate that. I'm not the, I'm not the arts and craftsy sort, but, uh, I got access to a drill. So I'll just drill the sides and then, and then, uh, I'll, I'll find some store somewhere or I'll just get some butcher cord or something like that. And just maybe if I lose confidence in its kind of ribbon style stuff, I'll, I'll do something myself. You know, it doesn't have to be too, too pretty from that angle, right? So that, I, I can't stress how satisfying it is to be able to look some of this stuff up and solve a problem yourself. And I, I learned some new stuff. It might not stick in me, right? Because uh, this is the only purpose I've ever found for that particular thing. But it's just like learning how to tie my boots. If I do this once, I learned this thing once, I spent probably way too much time. My luxury time is this kind of fun research. I don't necessarily need to keep this in my head anymore, but once it's done, it's done. And I know how to look it up again, if I ever forget how to do this. And there's a satisfaction now every time I look at this thing that I, I spent that bit of work. So that effort paid off for a for every moment in the future that I have access to that mask, whether or not I'm going to be wearing it that day, right? So if I decide to abandon next Halloween, then th that accomplishment is still there, still there. And so I, I built some good memories. That The return on that time, that investment, is quite high now. But but I also want to talk about other things because the I know it's kind of like, it's bad for me to start talking about that other more snowy holiday that happens after Halloween, because there's kind of a rule. So for our European listeners, the there's a rule about when we start talking about from one particular season's holidays to this other festive thing that happens when it snows. Now, we're kind of not supposed to be talking about that other one, the, the winter one. So we have the fall one and we don't talk about winter right now. And so we have a separation there, but I, I do when entering into that, into the winter phase of stuff, uh, I have started a traditions for that. And I don't have a lot of, I mean, I wasn't, we have some cultural stuff and it's hard for people to comprehend the idea of Canada having culture. Cause it's like, well, Canada is just, it's not America blank stare. And, uh, but there's a lot of stuff like Halloween is one of the very significant parts of our culture. And there's stuff that happens in that other holiday that shall not be named, but that, that is unique to, uh, not exactly my experience, but some of my, my Dutch side of stuff. And I've decided to adopt things and try to bring them into my life as an adult, even though it's, it's not a family thing or anything like that. So it's something I'm kind of making for myself and a bit of my household kind of thing. And it's, uh, there's, there's one thing that I just don't have enough of cause it's expensive and you need to have, oh, I just realized I can't eat it. Anymore. Okay. I'm going to eat the carb blockers and I'll just be, have such of a certain holiday that shall not be named spirit that it will, it will balance out the mood problem. <laughs> so it's something I, I'll try to pronounce in Dutch. It's hachelslach. It's a chocolate sprinkles, but it's not the chocolate sprinkles you find on donuts, right? It's, uh, or ice cream or whatever the heck. So this is Dutch proper chocolate. And it, it's hard to explain this to other people. Like there's the kind of chocolate that you think is chocolate that you might get at a store. The chocolate sprinkles, that's, that's garbage. That's chocolatey sprinkle. 
uh, the stuff that's made in literally this is made in the Netherlands and I get it shipped. Well, I know a I know a couple that has a business that gets stuff shipped in from the Netherlands, and they'll ship it across the country, and it's it's subsequently it's expensive. <laughs> so, so this that's why this is kind of a seasonal thing. And so uh, this stuff is actual proper chocolate, proper, proper chocolate. In my case, it's, it's uh, dark chocolate because milk chocolate for this seems really wrong. Um, keeping in mind that I haven't tried it with milk chocolate, so maybe I'll regret saying that. I think maybe this year I'll make an exception and get the milk chocolate kind uh, as well. Now, the thing is, uh, <laughs> this is kind of a lunch thing too, which is really strange for people to, to learn. So... You have to get bread, but it has to be good bread, like really good quality bread. So I've got a bakery that's not too far. So I'll probably just pop in there and I'll, I'll, I might actually bring a box and be like, this is what I'm trying to do and, and have them and maybe just like bribe them with a box or something like that. But, but get, I'll probably bring what you do is you take really good white bread, you butter it lightly, and then just sprinkle this stuff on. The butter is really only there to make sure the sprinkles don't fall off, but it is it also adds to a kind of richness. And I'll, I'll probably try it right there at the bakery because they have a little cafe next to it. And uh, and that's, that's a tradition that I want to just kind of insert at that particular – there's kind of a seasonal break that happens between the two. And so I'm curious about that. I'm kind of, you know, it'll be like a November thing. And so that's, that's something that I'm kind of looking forward to. There, there's a, the thing with the winter holiday, um, where, um, we would give out chocolate letters and it would be the same really good quality, not quite as good, but same really good quality chocolate, but they'd be giant. They'd be giant letters and you just get one with your first names, first initial, right? And, uh, that company, the, the, co either the company died or they stopped producing it or something like that, but it would later come out some years later. So it kind of got interest came back. So it's not exactly a deep tradition or anything like that. It just happened to be kind of a family thing for a little bit. And so I kind of want to do that, but it's weird because some letters are more common than others because some names are more common than others. So uh, sometimes your, your letter of preference <laughs> is, is not available this year. <laughs> so I'm thinking, well, do I have to buy this like early, buy them early and then have chocolate just hanging out for a year <laughs> or is it too late? Maybe, maybe if I order the stuff now, like end of October, I'll have it and it'll be, I'll make sure I get it. Maybe I'll do that. I don't know. I know one guy I could give him chocolate, um, and he does, he actually doesn't like chocolate. I, I could say I've met a person that does not like chocolate. I've had this conversation and no, he's like, yeah, chocolate. Yeah, I don't care. I don't really care for it. I, apparently, wow. Like, like, I don't know. I don't know. Minion, do you like chocolate? Not a fan of actual chocolate, but milk chocolate's okay. Oh. So have you had, okay, so. We went to the, to this one, this other bakery. So this specialist bakery where, uh, you got the chocolate in croissants. So it's like a French bakery specialist, isn't it? Something like this. I can't remember. Uh, they're a chocolate pastry sort of shop. Yeah, they do regular chocolates too. I think I remember they had, they do regular, but I just get the croissants every now and then. Oh, I haven't had one in a while, mm -hmm. long while. Hmm. <laughs> Either way, they just, it's, I think they use actual chocolate, but it's tolerable for me because they're mixing with pastries. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, so that's very similar to my, my chocolate sprinkle thing where you'd have, uh, the occasional, and this is, this is a proper French bakery. That's why they have actual good croissants and everything. Um, that can be your tradition. <laughs> I don't know if you want to make it a, a a December tradition, let's say. Definitely not. Why? It's not your you don't want to make it a tradition or or what? You just don't like that the winter holiday? There's certain things you want to make a tradition. This 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 doesn't feel like one of them. So, like what prompts you to even go out and and buy this stuff 
Um, and because it's right next to a mall, well, it's not next to, it's kind of, if you ever wanted to go to a mall, this is the sort of, you go to that mall and then this would be not too far away. So, I mean, you've had opportunities to go visit this place. What actually prompts you to, to go? What prompted you last time? That we went there or that I went there? Yeah. Um, I think it was just a rare craving. So you wanted the the sweets? Were you craving for chocolate? <laughs> Don't remember at this point. Yeah, so you just kind of have something internal to you that prompts you to. And I think that's what you did. You just, you, oh, I don't know. If, I don't think you were doing anything else that day and you just swung by. Maybe you were already driving. But you're the kind of guy who's like, I want to go for a drive anyway. I'll just go here. Um, but I... I don't know. I I would totally turn that into, into a tradition. I'd probably make you drive me there, and then uh, then I I can't remember if I had any of it. I must have had one. I think I've had one, but they're expensive. I think you bought something from them, but from there, but you don't think you had one of those. I don't. You had you got everything else. You got something else, but I don't think you bought one. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe maybe I ate one of yours or something like this. But I can't remember being particularly impressed. Probably because of the price. Um, may, I I should I tend to care less about such things over the holidays, um, and I just like these these treats. I don't. The thing is, bread is going to start becoming a treat now because <laughs> it's going to be pretty rare. Like I haven't bought a loaf of bread in a long time, um, and just bread itself is oh man. Bread. I'm telling you, man, bread, bread is one of the things that I could just eat lots of. It's so good. Like good, proper, fresh bread. Uh, I can't bake worth crap, but other proper bakery stuff. You had a bread maker. I did. And I used why, it. Why did you give up on it? Um, it planned obsolescence, right? So the, okay. So the way a bread worker works. So for, we're going to have some weird audience members in the future. So People in the future who will never have heard of bread makers because they will be banned or something dumb. Okay, so a bread maker is a is two parts. The inner part is a metal bin, which has uh, paddles in it, and the paddles are removable. So what you end up with is you end up baking bread that has holes in it. So what you do is you put all the ingredients in, and then the machine spins these paddles to knead all the bread. And then it heats up an element underneath this pan. And so it ends up being kind of like a toaster oven and it bakes it in there and you pull it out and you have to fish the paddles out. So you end up with like these gouged bottoms of the bread and this stuff like this, but it's good bread and it's cheaper. And although the bread machine costs money, right? Okay. Okay. Now the paddles are removable from the bin itself, from the, the metal bin. But there are these posts that go out from the bottom of the bin, out into the machine, to the base of the machine, and there's the motors that actually spin it. Okay, so the, the, so the paddles go on posts, the posts penetrate through the bottom into the machine, and that's how it turns things. Hopefully I'm explaining that fairly well. Now, that, that assembly uh, is, is clipped together by a mechanism that prevents it. So when you pull the, the bin out of the machine to like turn your bread out, um, there is, you can pull the paddles out, but you can also pull the posts out to kind of clean the affairs. And the post connection to the paddle has like a, a, a connecting pin. That pin was made of a metal that's designed to rust and so whenever I pulled the bin out, or if I was, or if I was like, cause you mix things and then you put the bin in, but if I mix things and put the bin in, I mix things and then the pin falls out and my stuff leaks out the bottom. <laughs> so like the entire affair was obnoxious. Uh, it, it, it kind of rusted and would fall apart as I'm trying to use it. So I just went, Oh, this isn't working out. Cause I still don't know how to make banana bread script. And, um, it's just one of those first world responses that I had. I, man, it's, yeah. So, so yeah. So it, it was planned obsolescence that made me get rid of the, my bread maker. Um, so, so yeah, that's, 
that's me. Um, and and it was partly I I suspected for a long time that that bread was getting to be bad for me, so I had already taken steps to give up on it. Um, and I'm I'm not going to get another bread maker. I'm not going to bake anymore, which is annoying. I'm going to be baking my date square still because maybe I can get some gluten-free wheat. I did buy a giant bag of wheat, uh, of general purpose baking wheat, uh, just in time to not want to use wheat anymore. <laughs> so uh, so I'll, I'll use that up and then I'll just be done. Actually, on that note, I did start earlier today researching gluten-free stuff. So I'm like, it's really upsetting not understanding how to eat anymore. And so I'm like, well, there's a lot of people that either are or claim to be gluten sensitive, right? So there's an industry that's pivoted to uh, gouge those people. And so there's a lot of products that are gluten-free. It's like, there are gluten-free oats. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's really awesome. How is that? Wait, what? And I go on a research, it's like, oats don't have gluten in them. <laughs> Period. That's that's not that's that's not a thing. It's not a thing. It's not a uh, a substance that is found in oats. <laughs> but the thing is, it's found in the machines that might also uh, that might also process oats. So those machines, it's like an allergy thing, right? So if the machines had handled other wheat related stuff, maybe some of the gluten from them might cross contaminate into the oats. Okay. So they actually have like, you can check Amazon for, for Quaker brand, um, Quaker, Quaker brand, quick Quaker brand, quick oats that are gluten-free. And it's just the weirdest thing to see. But if you're hi highly sensitive, then okay. I'm not highly sensitive. I don't think I'm not going to declare myself to be highly sensitive right now. Um, so I don't need things to be gluten free as such. I just need to know what the heck gluten is and avoid those products or get replacements or whatever. Anyway, anyway, so because I can still use a little bit of flour, I'm okay for, for cooking, for baking, for this kind of stuff for, with a little bit. So hamburger bun, okay, should be okay. Don't overdo it. Um, but not French toast, right? But not pancakes, not waffles. Um, and it would so it, I know that it can't be a meal. And this is the other thing that I'm still concerned about. So uh, rice is gluten-free and lentils are gluten-free. And I used to have a lentil rice dish. I talked about it before. Really nice. And you can curry it too, which makes – everything should be curried. It's just great. Um, and uh, and I think that's why I suspect that there's just some pure carbohydrate thing happening with me. So I, I think I'm getting rid of that. Um, I think th uh, that was a problem because it was an entire meal thing. I would just have that and it would be like lunch and dinner or something like that. And then the next day I would be grumpy. And so I have a bunch of that, but it's like, well, because there's rice and lentil flour kind of stuff and you can get noodles that way and I'm thinking of ordering some of that. So, so life is going to be weird. Life is going to be weird. And Again, all this might be interesting to a lot of people, but there's not going to be anybody that's really quite like me. So I might, uh, I don't think it's worthwhile for me to talk about this part of myself because uh, talking about the mood stuff, okay. Talking about some of the other weird stuff, okay. But talking about like car carbohydrates are poison. Like, <laughs> does that apply to everybody? Well, probably a little bit, but I mean, I don't, I don't want to have like big wheat come after me for, for bad mouthing carbs, something like this. Um, on to the next thing. Ah, okay. So I, I, I had to remove all these crackers from my Amazon. I actually had it pending in my save later for my, my shopping cart on Amazon. And I had to remove it from all my shopping lists. I had to take all my crackers and take all my cookies. Like, Oh, because I found one cookie that doesn't have garbage in it. And so I like it. It was cheap. Oh, it was so good. But I eat uh, I eat a meal of it. I eat it like chips. <laughs> and it's cheap too. So, I mean, I can do that and not feel bad about the cost. And so I can't eat cookies anymore. 
I'm declaring myself as not being able to eat cookies anymore. So I'm going to make sure that I get some chocolate whole food and chocolate soy lint. These are meal replacements. And uh, those will be, those are going to be meals again. So, but I love the chocolate stuff. So hopefully I can like, I can remove that addiction on things like cookies. Um, Soylent used to do that for me. So I'll, I'll probably switch to that again, depending on what it tastes like now. It's been so long, they've reformulated stuff. So who knows? Who knows? But there's this other, it's particularly a winter tradition, but I'm going to make it like my November-ish tradition, November, December, January kind of thing. But it's horrifyingly expensive because I'm getting it imported from the Netherlands again. It's called, I can't pronounce it properly, it's speculas. And what it is, is it's, a, it's you would you would make it a parallel to gingerbread cookies. Uh, they, these are also called windmill cookies, but it, there's a, it's a special kind of spice that's put into a, a cookie and it's absolutely phenomenal for dipping in tea. So that's the way I eat it. And I don't actually overeat it because number one, it's expensive. And, uh, and number two, cause you're dipping it in tea, it's kind of slows me down and it makes me appreciate it. It's really good. Oh, it's so good. Um, and I can't even remember, like, it's, it's one of those when you're at, you know, grandma giving you this kind of stuff, so you have childhood memories of this sort of thing. And so that's probably where my appreciation come, comes from. Um, so, so yeah, Minion, I, I think I might actually start some household traditions depending on how other people work. I've already got some stuff. I don't think I'll buy you anything because just my presence should be a gift to you every single day. <laughs> But, but if you want to start doing something, then we can, I'm, I'm totally going to be buying some lights. Uh, you're learning, you're going to go do some baked goods or something. I don't know. It, is that something you would want to do? Like sit down and just, and bake cookies or something? Muffins, <laughs> something small cupcakes. So there's your, do you remember nature box? Yes, I do. Okay. So they had this thing, lemon, almond, biscotti bites that were actually very nice and they accompanied so many things. They just, I don't know why they stopped. Sort of like how McDonald's discontinued something and I picked it up and did it at home. I think I'm going to do that as well. Okay. So you have a dream. Okay. I have a thought. And not the right kind of thought either. Want. So, okay. So, so what have I taught you so far? Not that anything sunk into you. Okay. So first thing you do is you write all that, that stuff down like these are the things i want to learn okay and then you you take one of the things and you figure out what the language is so you just stumble around begging google for some search results and just remember that you are just okay you're a little bit more dumb than most other people but if you just inarticulately put some words out into a search engine that will be the very the the same kinds of words that other people in your position would also use. And because the topic is not new, you're not researching some, some cutting edge new thing. Th these are recipes that are old and they're being shared openly. You will find the something that is fairly good because it's going to be fairly popular and it's going to be, have been picked up by all these badly worded uh, attempts for searching. So you just have to remember that you're on the same footing as a lot of other people. So the, the path has already been trodden. So you just have to search for this stuff. So you just pick one of those stuff up. It'll be your afternoon thing. You know, you'll be between matches. You'll be sitting in a queue waiting for something and just, you know, tab out, just clickety clack and get a recipe. And just get a few recipes and set them aside. And then the next time you have a moment, just like, hey, you know, and just because maybe it's too much for you to do it all at once to, to like just clear your schedule and make that your afternoon thing because I don't get the impression you're like that. Um, and then next opportunity, go and read them. And the next opportunity, read them and think about, well, what tools do I need? Well, what ingredients do I need? Like how much time does it take? How, and then, then you would need to take an inventory of what stuff you have access to. So it's like, well, 
Do you have the right kind of baking trays? Do you have like, and it would just go on and on like that. And you would start gathering that information, making just, you'd have like a folder on your desktop. You'd plunk a notepad in there and you would, you would type in the requirements that you have. You'd build a shopping list or something like this. And it just goes on like that. And that might take you a month. Okay. And you'd have to go grocery shopping for specialty stuff depending on what you want to do. Like some people, they're like, I want to know how to make my own waffles. So they actually go out and buy a special waffle maker and all these other, like a special dropper that they use for um, pushing out. Like it's almost like a, a the, these, you know, they're for cakes. They're for icing, little icing bags. They'd get something like that in a tube where they can actually depress and they can exude exactly the correct amount of, um, of what would you call it, of, of pastry mix <laughs> to make waffles or to make pancakes or something like that. Some people spend an, an outrageous amount of money and maybe that would be part of the thing that would motivate them to actually do the thing, to actually, you know, oh, I spent all this money, I, I actually should probably get around to doing this. Um, and don't be like that. You should not be like that. So yeah, just <laughs> quote unquote, just do it. So yeah, why not? Well, just that can be something for you to look forward to. That sounds like a tradition you can do. And then every, if, if it's only every year, then okay. Every year you learn uh, to bake something new. And now you bake everything from the past plus this new thing. So every year you've got more variety, for example. And maybe you'll learn that's your thing. Maybe it'll be really easy for you. Um, I won't help. I think you need to do something on your own. You're you're almost a grown-up now. Almost. Um, oh, uh, you remember the peel-off thing. That's another thing, isn't it? Do you want to talk about... Um, so I had, I had mentioned before about peel-offs, about how to do it right, and it's easier for rice and all this kind of stuff. And you were on board, but you said that you wanted to go to like a restaurant of some sort and taste the proper version of that. So it's very much like you having tasted this bakery's version of this, and now you want to do it yourself, which is totally what I did with learning date squares. Now, do you want to, to still like go to a place? I, I, oh, I don't know where I can find a Persian restaurant. That would be the right thing to do. Um, like an Iranian restaurant or something like this, right? Um, and they would give you a peel off. And do you still want to like go out and find a place that makes it and then try that and then, then try to do it yourself? Does that even matter? Like, honestly, I think that's holding you back. It'd be nice, but looking back on how. Looking back on. No, I got nothing on that. Um, looking back on either. No, I got nothing right now. Okay. So I don't, so when you decide that you want to go and try the professional version of it, what you're doing is you're setting a bar for yourself and then you'll come back and try it. And people will play pretend that you can do something that's, that's comparable or that's okay. But really, cause you don't know what you're doing, it's going to be bad. And you want to recognize that it's going to be bad. But the last thing that you want is for you to try something on your own for it to be bad, then it to be compared to good or great. Because then it looks really bad. It's really depressing. It's really demoralizing. So for some... Well, a somewhat related tale to the... Or something related to somewhat relate to this. Uh, I was told a story when I was in school by my doctor who visited who did a guest who was a guest speaker for the class mm -hmm. so he told us uh one tale where in uh, the these guys were sailing on a ship and then all of a sudden the ship they're sailing across the ocean from one place to another and it was your standard voyage of however long and then all of a sudden the ship got um the ship got into a storm. Well, I'm I don't remember it clearly, but general the general points. But the ship got into a, a bad storm and they got wrecked, but they were still somewhat saleable and just barely saleable, and everything was in parts and so in tatter, 
was in ruins and such, and they were just slowly drifting. Two people were alive. One person was very injured, and he needed medical attention. He couldn't see for some reason, and he was injured beyond, so he had to be restrained and just placed there. Another person was taking care of him and such, and feeding him. Er, and as he was feeding him, he was giving it, he was feeding the injured person this item called a seagull sandwich, seagull sandwiches. And a few days or weeks later, they managed to make it to shore, and things weren't to normal. Uh, a while later, the guy invited the injured guy invited the person who saved him out to lunch because he saved them and such. And on the menu, they noticed a sign called Seagull Sandwiches. And he pointed out and said, wow, that's great. I'll have to, I'll have, uh, we'll just have these. And the guy who fed them said, are you sure? He's like, yeah, I'll have Seagull Sandwiches. You saved my life. With, this is, you saved me and this is what uh, saved my life. And as he was eating them, he said, wow, these are completely different from what I normally eat. And then they had their meal and off they went. Later on that day, the guy that fed the injured guy went and killed himself. And you were told this story at school. <laughs> I was told the story at school like grade 12. Okay. And it got me thinking, it's like, uh, so he just cannibalized the person without telling him? Oh. Okay, so we actually said he was giving the guy seagull sandwiches, but it was the the other guy. Yeah. Okay, that that took me a bit. <laughs> so that's I actually prompted you to tell a story. This is great. This is great. This is like I can't count the number of times. So somewhat related is try it out first by someone who actually knows what they're doing, and then do the testing yourself. In a roundabout way of saying it. I mean. I I think that that's introducing an extra hurdle because you have to now figure out where to go to get a good peel off. Not that you can tell the difference between good and bad. So you you would have to learn where and then go there and then eat there, which which is all pro all manner of problematic, especially now. Like you had an opportunity last year, but you didn't take it. Right? And now it's going to be tough. And rather than just take a bunch of advice online and then try something and be like, Hey, you know, this is compared to the nothing <laughs> compared to the no expectation that I had. This isn't bad. Okay. And then one day later going to a restaurant being, you know what? Let's see. <laughs> Cause you know, yeah, you're happy with your stuff. Now let's see what a professional can do. And you get the opposite effect is you go to a restaurant, you try what they have, they give you what they got. You're like, hmm, you know what? I can do better. <laughs> uh, I, I like that idea more. But I mean, if that's, I support you on going and, you know, bring a girlfriend out or something and go eat peel off, <laughs> whatever, whatever, I don't, I just can't think of a place that has, that will say they do peel off. It's just, it's like a pre preparation thing for rice. It would always be something, some dish, um, that they would put on top of. Well, I could try the peel off by itself and then just whatever else they do. Well, let's say, for example, if you go to an excellent, uh, I want to say just, just like, let's say Mexico. So a Mexican restaurant, um, we can take the example of that uh, one restaurant I brought you to. Because mm -hmm. maybe what they do is they do make a pilaf, and you, they just don't tell you. I guess it'd be sort of like a pilaf, but they just boil down the rice and stuff and mix into it after a while. Because it's not your normal rice. It's like flavored with mixed with other things. Yeah. And the thing is, pilaf is French, so... Maybe if you want the authentic thing, you would go to a French restaurant. I'm not sure I know how to find something like that. I mean... Don't think there's one here in this area. Well, yeah, I mean... <laughs> best we can do is French bakery. Wow, oh well. Um, but, so, I mean, cast a wider net and maybe and 
C, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't, for a lot of restaurants, because a lot of fairly fast restaurants would not do the pilaf stuff. They might do the, the prep work that is the equivalent of a pilaf, but the finishing touches on rice is the, is 20 minutes to, to make the pilaf after the fact, right? And that's not going to happen for most restaurants. Most restaurants, it's, they want it out in 10, maybe, well, I, I don't know, right? So a good Mexican restaurant, because they use like the same four ingredients in different varieties, different orders, spiced differently, right? Um, they're going to have a whole lot of stuff that's just ready to go way ahead of time. So I, I, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, just try all, oh, what's that movie? Uh, I can't remember the name of the movie. Okay, so it has one character in it who's a bad guy. And his thing is, his shtick is, he travels from place to place to place, and he'll find whatever the heck restaurant that's famous for one very specific dish. Uh, I don't, I don't, it's not once upon a time in Mexico, but it's kind of in that, it, it's a neighbor to that. And so he looks for this one kind of traditional dish. And, and if he likes it, he goes and shoots the chef. <laughs> and so that, that's the thing. Um, and it's just a hilarious little shtick. But the idea is, and I had this, I had this idea for a long time. So I, I whenever I go to a place, I, I order a very specific kind of curry with whatever their version of that curry dish is, which is like I went to a really nice Vietnamese restaurant and got a yellow curry from them and a West Indian curry is the absolute best. And and you can you can and so that's my thing. So maybe the thing that you would kind of start is like, whenever you go and you eat out, you just find whatever rice dish they have and just, and ask the server like, Hey, oh, like, how is this rice prepared? What, what else is in it? What's going on? Obviously, cause you can't handle like time, <laughs> like spices are no good for you. Um, would you, you, there's a whole lot of restaurants that you probably wouldn't be particularly comfortable with because they do fun stuff with rice yeah and uh what you would do is you go from like restaurant to restaurant and just see like what kind of rice dishes they have and, just, and that would be your thing and without the shooting their chef thing because that's illegal in canada for all of our international <laughs> for all of our listeners <laughs> um oh where what i was talking about okay so i just totally switched topics now I totally switched topics. Okay. And I'm going to stop you on that and go to a break. Oh, are we on break? Oh, I was just actually unpausing it for that. Okay, so we'll be back in I don't know how long. <laughs> I'll see you guys soon. Five minutes. Five? Well. Give or take. And we're back. Well, this is uh, 2020-1007, episode 25. So this is going to be our final segment here. Yeah, so that is not time until next break. That is time until show ends. And this is, uh, I want to talk a lot about administrivia here. But first, because it's kind of related to the Mexican food thing that I brought up, uh, I made some chili because it's, there's carbs in it, right? But um, it's, it's this, this kind of staple was a part of my life for a long time. And uh, so I'm bringing it back because I'm kind of running out of other stuff that I can eat because I'm starting to get dietarily restricted elsewhere. And uh, I didn't buy black beans because I, I, I derped and I got, uh, well, I got eight cans of red kidney beans instead of four of one and four of black beans. So I actually uh, had a guy like, hey, I, you know, I've got these black they're actually refried black beans. You want those? Like, oh, okay, sure. I guess it doesn't really matter if it's going into chili, right? Turns out it does matter, but it's good. It's actually really good. It, it makes the chili because there's a, a consistency problem with chili and you always feel like you're going to have to boil it way down. And no, hey, I the mistake that I made in a grocery store turns out that it uh, it it really works. It really works. So I'm going to take advantage of this for, um, for my next recipe and my next recipe. And I'll just, I'll buy that kind of bean from now on. It's, Hey, that's awesome. This is one of those fortuitous things. Okay. So 
for the administrative stuff, oh, I am so excited to talk about all this stuff. I know I'm not going to have enough time and I'm not going to talk too fast to try to get through it all. Okay. So I have expanded my, uh, my field of interest out from the audio engineering side of stuff. Cause I'm more or less, I more or less know what I need to know. And I've got all the, the I've got one macro chain down and it does what I want to do. I'm, I've got one tweak that I want to pursue, which is to maximize audio output. So targeting a certain maximum audio output and all kinds of problems happen when you're starting to, to do that. And also moving, uh, possibly removing noise removal and just have noise gating happening early on. I, I no, no. Okay. Oh, now that I thought of it, no, that's not going to work. Okay. Because of how I understand noise getting to work. Okay. So there's some fiddly stuff that I'm still thinking about and then I'm done. Then I could delegate some of that audio processing to minion, but it doesn't really matter because I can just tab out and play one match in heroes of the storm or something like that, or go and watch YouTube videos, which was what I was doing to learn about uh, instead of the, like the software side of stuff, learning about the real, the real world side of stuff. I've been listening to this guy for a little while. I'm probably going to go back and, and watch every one of his videos from the beginning. Uh, cause he's, he's good. He's interesting. He's got some real potential. It's a, uh, can I remember his name? Mike Delgatti, I think is his name. Uh, his, uh, YouTube channel, I'll link it is booth junkie. And, and he does all kinds of product reviews, but he also talks a lot about stuff, a lot about the, the business. He's a voiceover guy. So he does voice acting and this kind of stuff. And he does it for a living. And this YouTube stuff is kind of on the side. He's got a beautiful voice. It's amazing. And he's really, really entertaining. His videos are really good. And it's not like they're incredibly high production value or anything like that. He's just, he's really good. It's, it works. It works. So I've been listening to that. And then I've been researching all kinds of peripheral stuff when I, I learn things. So I'm building my Amazon shopping list because I'm really, I'm doing the window shopping, trying to understand this stuff. And I'm trying to think about things that would improve. Yes, this podcast, but also for my other narration interests, I've been thinking about doing stuff. I've done a little bit here and there and nothing professionally and just kind of side projects and the stuff that I've doodled, I've, I've also voiced and I want to improve that. I want to kind of restart that. And so I'm learning about microphones and I'm learning about all the different technologies. And most recently, most recently I was learning about, um, about actual room treatment and stuff like this. So I'll get into that a little bit later. So, so first, first, um, I had talked about, I believe it was last show about my inability to hear myself and that possibly being problematic. I don't like it. And it's a problem that I want to solve. So there is a feature in windows that lets you listen to a device so you can speak and listen to it. So you can speak into a microphone and hear it. <laughs> and normally it's just a bad idea because it causes this nasty feedback loop. But if you have headphones on, you can use that, but it's awful. It's awful because there's a delay. Now there's another version of it in audacity, which actually lets you uh, like listen as you're recording and it's awful because there's a delay. Okay. Now for, uh, for my microphone. So I've, I've got behind me, I've got a blue Yeti that I'm not using cause it's probably damaged, but it's quiet. And I've got a Yeti nano that I got as a kind of temporary holdover and it's got a monitoring, uh, headphone jack. Now, I tested it out and it works and there's no delay. That's the entire point of having it on the device itself. Okay. So I tried it and it, and it works and it's okay. I, I have to rig things up a certain way so that it, it's an audio device so that it can actually output all my system sounds as well as being a monitor for what it hears as a microphone. So to actually hear myself. So I learned a little bit that. Okay. So here's the problem. I planned ahead for a lot of stuff. I planned ahead and I got a shock mount that's big, that's meant for the original Yeti. Cause my intention was to get an original Yeti again, to buy a replacement, to save up for something that's like three times the cost. But I could put this little thing in the shock mount for now. And if it it's, it's doing quite well. Okay. The problem is 
because the mount is made for the full size microphone, and this is a little one, this little one has the littler surface area for all these doodads on the back for its power and for its headphone jack. And that gets blocked. Um, so I, I need to, I've already looked into how I can rig out and I actually have some parts being shipped over soon. Well, you know, not soon enough. Right. And so I'll have to hang the mic differently in order to get a microphone to get a, a what are called monitor headphones. And so I got to learn about that because now I'm understanding some more of the terms. Okay. So monitoring headphones, it's like a class of headphones. Okay. So the, the purpose is for monitoring. So what those head, so you might think headphones are headphones are headphones. And then if you look at them, there are some numbers and you think about quality and you think of, okay, monitoring is a specific class of headphone, which I don't know. I didn't know about it. It's what I've always wanted my entire life. So what it is, is it's a flat equalizer, a good set of monitor headphones. is totally flat. They're not any of those dumb, um, they don't brighten the, the sounds. They don't have a bass boost. They don't, it's nothing. It's just dead flat. I'm of the opinion that that equalization should happen right at the player. So whatever player you're using should have the equalizer features. Um, or maybe your system itself somehow should have it, but not built in because it's hard to undo that stuff. Like the silly Bluetooth things that I have now, oh, they're absolutely awful because they lift the boost and I can't stand, they lift the bass and I can't stand bass. So it's awful. So I definitely don't want monitor headphones that are like that because I don't want to hear my voice all bass boosted. Um, that would be terrible. That would be terrible. So I learned about monitor headphones. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what's important. So the reason I have headphones in right now is so that I can have system sounds without having that leak out and into um, wash into the microphone and cause a problem where if I'm listening off stream after the fact, listening to my audio track, I don't hear other stuff. I just hear my voice. So if I want to hear my voice, I have to make sure my microphone is only capturing my voice. Okay. So I'm taking the responsibility of audio away from my desktop speakers and putting them in my headphones. Okay. So, and that, that works very well. So that indicates the next problem, which is the kind of headphones you would want for this purpose have to be able to keep the sound in. And there are, th there are th uh, several kinds of headphones. So the ones that I have, they're like the sports kind. They fit into your ear. So they're, they're in ear earbuds. And that's a, that's pretty common if you're just uh, playing music on your phone, which is why I have these. It's definitely not suited for this particular purpose because, uh, my voice goes funny doing this right now. Maybe if I hear myself, it'll be a little bit better, but my experience with that is, uh, so but I, I can't do that because I need a wire into this, into this microphone. So I need to actually monitor by a wire because Bluetooth monitoring, I don't know if that's a thing. So I, I have to replace these earbuds anyway. So what else, what other choices do I have? Well, there's another kind called on ear, which is just the foam pads or whatever the heck that press in on your ear. They don't go inside your ear. So like the very old fashioned, like Walkmans had the little puff metal headband thing. And there's all kinds of classes of it now that are all better, but it's the same stuff. It's right on your ear. And the thing is there's all kinds of angles where it's all kinds of opportunities for the audio to leak out and hit a microphone. Now that ju doesn't generally matter if your microphone is bad. So if your microphone is bad, it's not sensitive enough to pick up that stuff. Or maybe that doesn't matter enough because you're it, because, because now if I'm thinking longer terms about doing voice over work, which I'm thinking about more, I might explore that as my next, you know, the next thing that I'm curious about is I'll just go explore that and I'll be a voice actor for a little while. I don't like the idea of becoming something else to, to talk about some other like, I don't like the idea of selling a commercial by becoming a personality for that particular segment. That's just, that doesn't appeal, but I might do audiobooks or something like that. And Hey, I know about this podcast that I could do. 
Anyhow, there's this third type of microphone or type of, of headset called, well, the circumoral is how I've always known them to be, but they're, they're around the ear headphones. So they're much, much larger um, cups where your ear doesn't touch it. So the idea is this rests against your head, against your skull and like your jaw and stuff like this. And your ears neither touch the, the actual membrane of where the speaker is, and they don't touch the, the actual outside edge of the ball at all. Your ears are just there with nothing touching them. So it's, so it's a different kind of comfort. Now, that has the opportunity of having nice, big memory foam or whatever the heck, and sound can't leak out, generally speaking, if it's done right. Right, so you can always crank up the volume on your when you're monitoring, and that and that just gets so loud that it leaks out of your headphones. This kind of stuff is theoretically possible, but but that's so that's the third class, and then there's this extra stuff. So there are there are problems where uh, the person might need to hear high quality music, but they also need to hear their environment. So some DJs, if you ever see videos of DJs, they'll be holding, they'll have a pair of really good headphones but there are the headphones that turn so they can collapse, but, but they've done that. So they've collapsed one, one set, one side of it. And then just holding that up to the side of their head and they're listening through one ear. So they have the other ear so they can hear the crowd, for example. Um, that's, uh, that's, I get that's for fashion, generally speaking. And so the audience knows that that the DJ is actually listening to them as well. So there's a little bit of participation happening there. Uh, but there are uh, headphones where that's built in, where they're called open back, which means that they'll have uh, the mechanics of the headphone itself will have holes in it that will just directly let outside sound in. And there's a partially open. A partially open is the same idea. It's just not so effective. And then there's closed. And closed back, the intention is to keep sound in, and try to keep sound out. Nothing's perfect, right? But it's going to be very good at keeping the sound in. And that's what is important for uh, if I'm leaning up against the microphone and I, I'm listening to myself or I'm listening to something else, right? The system, a video game, whatever the heck, I don't want that audio to be, to leak out into my microphone. I, I, maybe what I would want to do if I was streaming, for example, is I want to have the game output to be in a separate channel that can be manipulated separately. And that would, that would be one track. And then I would want my voice to be a second, completely clean, separate track because I can perform certain audio magic on it separately between the game audio and my audio. For example, I can duck one out. So if I'm talking, I can make the game sounds quieter or whatever I want to do. Maybe I've got a, a, a second person that's talking and I need to have, I need to be able to do things with the voices, like the equalization settings and all this other kind of stuff that I will reveal once I figure out how to do it myself and I have some success with it. Um, so, so this is an example of the set of things that I learned. And now that I understand this stuff, I had to research some of the numbers associated. So, cause I want to know, well, what's the difference between $20 pair of headphones and a $50 pair of headphones. What, why are some of them $300, 600? Like what, what do they have to offer me? And now that I understand some of these terms, there's more of this, like, well, if you're, if you have monitoring headphones, there's two kinds. There's one that's like a regular headphone jack and there's other that are like studio level. And if they're studio level, they require certain stuff. And I, I don't have that class of hardware. So there's a whole lot of microphone, a whole lot of like all kinds of microphone computery stuff that I don't have and all kinds of headphone stuff that I can't use. So I had to understand that. And so I've just got like regular headphone, but they're flat. Okay. So flat equalizer. And they're, they have to be closed backed and they have to be circumoral for me because that would be most comfortable. And that's appropriate for not leaking audio. And, um, and there's all kinds of other specifications that are there to learn. So one of them is impedance, 
which is kind of like how efficient is the cabling and the mechanics of that pair of headphones. And if it's low impedance, it means that it requires less effort from the source, the audio source, to actually get a nice clean signal in, because that's the thing that I saw. Okay, that's the problem. The other set of headphones that I have that I retired because they're clickety-clack, they're annoying. Cheap headphones will be like that. As you move, they'll creak, and that was getting picked up by a microphone. That's absolutely awful. So you want, so if it's actually rated as being monitor headphones, that's one of the, the considerations, even if they don't talk about it. It's, it's not going to creak around. So you have some mobility without it actually being loud. Um, so the, the problem with my cheap headphones is when I plug them into as a monitoring headphones directly from this uh, microphone as a sound device, when I was doing that, um, I was getting that low background hiss. Now, I've got that now with the headphones that I've got in now. I'm actually rather hypersensitive to that, to everything everywhere. Once I can hear myself, it won't be so big a deal, right? But right now, uh, I'm so well isolated that I can just hear the tone from the actual headphones. So I'm hoping that you get low impedance headphones will require less boost and if you it requires less boost you can kind of turn down the volume on the monitoring feature and so you actually turn that hiss down so there is probably a limitation of this particular pretty budget microphone uh, that it just does introduce hiss and it's probably the the terrible uh, headphones that i was using so i've got lined up a pair of monitoring headphones that i'm looking at getting and I, I don't like headphones. Like I don't like headphones. I find them hot and uncomfortable. This is a reason to use them, and that will become a, an essential part of the toolkit that will be necessary for doing uh, voiceover work, for example. So I'm, I'm starting to collect. You know, Every month I've got a, a budget set aside that I'm buying, buying a pile of my stuff, um, and we'll see how it works. And I'll talk about it every time I introduce something new. And at some point, um, I'll have to like do an entire segment with already writing a script, and I'll just talk about all the stuff that I have, all the stuff that I felt was necessary and wasn't. Because technically speaking, you don't need headphones. Technically speaking, if you're doing voice work, you don't you don't need to hear. You just have remove them, and then you can just hear yourself talking, and no problem. <laughs> um, it's just this weird streaming situation, or if you're playing a video game, or if you're podcasting, that's when you need headphones. And so I'll talk about that in, at greater length. I'll actually plan out some kind of video. Maybe Mini can actually help me with that. It could happen. Who knows? Um, so, I mean, what what else? Um, yeah, so I want to raise the audio ceiling and, uh, and actually improve the quality of the audio here, but that actually might increase the noise in the audio tracks that we're laying down. So I'm not sure what's going to happen there. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess the last thing I want to talk about is uh, I'm removing stereo from all of our, our, all of our data. We do like I do. I'm talking into a stereo mic, but it doesn't matter. And it, it actually might be a harmful thing. So right now I'm more or less in front of the microphone. And the last thing that a listener would want, imagining that I have a listener that has good ears, um, I, the last thing that I would want is to be louder in one of their ears uh, and the other to be weak or for the, the quality of the voice to be different or for it to shift around because I move as I'm talking. And so that's actually a really bad thing. Having stereo is a bad thing. And I've been kind of trained to think that stereo is just better. It's like FM is better than AM, right? Okay. So uh, that's not true for podcasts. So I'm, I'm, we have been removing, we've been recording in mono. And the advantage of that is stereo is two tracks. And so by recording in mono, it's only one track. So it's half the data. And so that is uh, a much more efficient use of storage space 
and it's 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 the it's proper. So I'll be going back and I'll be editing all of our previous sources and stuff like that so that I reduce the file space. Um maybe while I'm at it I'll I'll save compressed projects and stuff like that, but I don't I don't think I want to bother with any of that nonsense. Um and just go and remove the stereo tracks, turn them into mono and then be done and like I'll prefer the left channel or whatever the heck else, it doesn't matter. And all the stuff that's up is up and it's been in stereo, but if it ever gets remastered or something like this, then, then it can go up in its proper mono. So people that are particularly sensitive, I think maybe they have already learned to turn things into mono, which is actually pretty straightforward for a lot of, a lot of stuff. Um, I know, so I keep going back to world of Warcraft because I'm not really doing much else in life. Um, but so playing the beta, they, they have some new accessibility features. And I think one of the features is uh, actually turning the game from stereo into mono because there are reasons. <laughs> I don't shrug. I don't know. I don't know about this stuff, but th there are features like that built into Android that I did bump into at one point. And now, now I understand why, because there are circumstances where you would not want to have stereo. You just wouldn't want it. Um, and I know a lot of podcasts want to have all these fancy effects where they're like having sound effects that do funny things in your ears, but like, nah, nah, that's okay. Uh, maybe you just have the, the voice be mono, but your effects fiddle around like that. But I would just be bothered by stuff like this. I don't really, so what's his name? Um, Ooh, I can't remember his name now. That's terrible. Okay. So he's the, he was the host of this old show called Reading Rainbow. Uh, he played the character Geordi LaForge in the Star Trek series. Anyhow, no, um, so I, kn I know him as the, <laughs> as the reading rainbow guy. And, uh, he, uh, actually started a podcast some time ago and I was kind of in on the ground floor cause I was, I was aware of one of his other projects to revive reading rainbow. And that didn't pan out because of licensing reasons and they, they were just, just jerks about it. And so he had to abandon, he got pushed out of the project essentially. And then it got quietly made inactive. And that was the, it was a Kickstarter thing. And so it was annoying because I, I, I backed the place, but it didn't go anywhere because of those reasons. So he went off and started a podcast and he does one of these podcasts where he's telling stories and he adds a lot of sound effects and stuff. That's part of the reason that production value is part of the reason why he's not able to actually keep up with content. And that's a lot of the problem that, that other, let's say YouTubers have is there's a problem. There's a, there is a production quality problem where if you're new, uh, trying to break through is hard because everybody that's already there has already earned from that platform and reinvested it into a higher production value. And what that's done is that that's made those other people in a tier all their own, even if they're not very good production value is high. And so for some person that is good, that is better than them, but it can't do the production value because they haven't been earning money and, and pulling that back in those people, uh, the high production value people end up having to spend a lot of work on making the best out of the production value they end up not being able to release so frequently. It's the big business, small business thing. The big business is kind of dealing with being big a lot. There's an inefficiency. They can't pivot for new technology. And these little guys, they have low production value because they have to, because they can't do big because they can't afford it or they don't know how, etc. They're still learning, but they make up for that in their interest and time. Their time isn't being spent on production value. So they have it and they can produce more regular content. So you get, you get these fancier podcasts that are about storytelling and they've got sound effects and all this kind of stuff. Well, that's taking away from working on the next show and the next show. And it's just now they're a uh, once every month thing. And then maybe they get better and it's once every few weeks but that's not going to compete with the next people over who have less production value. And so there's a little bit of a, a problem with, um, if you're up and running and you spend all this time and money and attention on 
improving your production value, um, you won't produce. You won't be producing in that time as you're learning, and you won't be producing as much because you're using that production value. And it may be more important to have a low production value and actually have output to maintain interest uh, rather than, I mean, because it's a sacrifice, right? So right now for this podcast, obviously we're the latter. We have low production value. I've been improving that kind of on my side of stuff in order to, to do audio processing and I'm constantly thinking about it and I've got like a pole made for balancing lights on. I've got a, a quilt over it that's doing a little bit of audio treatment now that I understand a little bit. And it's not good enough. <laughs> this, there's more that can be done. And the microphone is in a better position and all this kind of stuff. Right? So there's improvement that's happening, but we're able to be fast and loose. The the thing, okay, so so Minion, we had talked about this off stream, which is one of the most important things for you to be doing is to turn this into an actual podcast rather than a stream that gets put up on YouTube. So the next thing would be what multi-broadcasting to both Twitch and YouTube at the same time, right? Do that. And then just pick, pick a podcasting platform and just dominate it and just figure out, well, make an account and then figure it because everybody else is there. All the other less competent people are also making their own terrible podcasts. Well, if they can do it, why can't even little old you could probably figure it out? There are instructions. Uh, that service wants you to use them. They will tell you how. So make it happen. And if it requires my face, then okay. But if it's podcasting, it's proper podcasting. It's just audio, right? So I... I want progress for next show for you to like, tell me, Hey, I figured out how to do this and we're ready. And I'm going to start uploading something or other as a test. And, and then this is the app you get to be able to listen to podcasts. And I want you to start teaching me like w what you have learned so that you can get engaged, get involved and participate in actually improving what we've got. Cause right now, right now I need people to riff off of. Otherwise I will have less and less to talk about. I'm just going to have a bad day, come in with like three bullet points and then just be like, well, I guess we're done. Cause I got nothing out, nothing else in me. So we just get lucky every show where I just keep talking on and on and on and on. Cause I'm, I'm not actually the sort, believe it or not. It's just, I'm like that for this show. So, so Minion, have you identified a particular podcasting vector that you want to learn? that you can get, that you can get more information on? Like, is it just iTunes? iTunes takes an RSS feed, which we can, I did some reading the other day and we just need to throw it up on a, if you, if you host your podcast somewhere else, most of them, some of them do RSS and iTunes, you're just double dipping at that point. Okay. So once it's on there, you just get the feed and throw it to attach it to iTunes. So I've heard this thing about iTunes having this one month delay on actually releasing your podcast. Is is that actually true? I have not read into that. Okay. So you don't know if there's some official policy where they're actually scrubbing through to figure, find out if there's copyright infringement or if you have like wrong speak or something like this. So... I have no clue. Okay, okay. So the so that requires what? Uh, our hosting audio. So we need to understand the audio formats that they prefer. And so that's something you can do. And then um, hosting stuff, I guess I will figure that out. I have a hosting plan for my stuff, which will allow me to uh, assign a, like a secondary administrator to, to control some other like domain. So maybe I'll just set that up. I'll talk to the guys. So the story, since we have so much time left, so the story is I got in on the ground floor of a new startup doing hosting. And so I actually got lifetime hosting from them. Uh, so I kind of funded them as a startup to get going. So the, and it was really nice, right? Really nice to have. 
there are some basic limitations. Like there technically are bandwidth limitations and there technically are hard drive limitations, hard like space. There's technically CPU and the, right, but I, but it was just yeah you know, fine. It was it was hand wavy. Don't worry about it. You're fine. Except the company went under. <laughs> So they gave me a referral to these other guys and they, they migrated all my stuff over there, but I got to pay, uh, it's stupid. I got to pay again for all this kind of stuff. Yeah, it's, it's what you get. It happens in life. That's fine. So, so I went to this other company, but, but they're, they're, you know, little, it, they're small enough that I can actually get a hold of them and they, they already arranged a rather uh, like a slightly varying uh, hosting arrangement for me because I have, I have very minimal need for my stuff. It's like, I've got a business card style website for my author stuff. And I've got a couple other little projects, but there's, they're like one page kind of thing, or they're a redirect. And the only actual website I have is I've got a short URL service that I have for my own stuff. And, and I don't really use them. So I have like, a fee and I give them a year in advance or whatever the heck. And so like, yeah, we'll set you up, but we'll give you like a few months free here because you're a really light user and all this kind of stuff. But I can actually go to them. I can say, Hey, okay, well, we're thinking about doing this podcasting thing. I need, I need, these are the things that I'm interested in. Um, how does this change our relationship? Uh, how can I, how can I pay you more to manage this and just have them, the, have them, you know, hand wave some stuff at me and just, I'll throw money at them and make the problem go away. So I get the hosting figured out. That's not a big deal. Audio is not very big. If, if they're okay with like, if the mono and all that kind of stuff is, is okay. And we will probably tune the knobs down to like 128 kilobit MP3s audio of two and a half hours is actually not a very large file. And if that's good enough, then the hosting is going to be cheap. It's not going to take a lot of space for the entire backlog of what, 25 times three hours, right? However, the math, two and a half hours, that's actually not a lot of, of megabytes really is what it would be measured in just a, a handful of gigabytes. And so that's, that's easy to host, easy enough to host. And like I said before, there are one click hosting package setups for all kinds of stuff. I don't see why there wouldn't be something that would be just for podcasts that would work perfectly for everything. So, um, so wh whose court is this ball in? So do you want me to start looking at the hosting stuff or do you want to research more and then give me more information to work off of or what, how, how, what, huh? Like what happens now? Are you there? I am here thinking what happens. I have no clue. Okay. So that means the ball is in my court. Okay. So put on your to-do list. What I need to know, what we're going to need to know is what audio format does iTunes require? What are the specifications? That's a good piece of information for us to have. And so you need to learn how to create that. So we might need to reproduce all of our stuff, um, re re export it from our audacity project out into a specific file format and then maintain a, maintain a library of those wave files. Yeah, maybe we just do that. Shouldn't be hard. So maybe that's the thing that you can do next, figure out what iTunes wants, then build it and get ready. Okay. And then what I'll do is I will just look into what hosting RSS means. Let me, let me type that in now. And through the magic of post, I can remove all that. I love that. Okay. So that's something I can work on is the, the hosting side of stuff. And, um, like I said, once you grow up and you earn it, um, I, I would like to just hand it to transfer all this stuff over into an account in your name and separate it all so that I can just not care anymore. I do still want to be the archivist. I have so much stuff I want to do with my money that I don't want to have to buy another hard drive, but, um, but I can, I, I don't think I talked about it, but when I was disassembling my computer, one of the things I wanted to do is, uh, 
hook a pow an external power switch up to a hard drive that's in there because the system is intended to be low power, low heat, low noise, and a hard drive spinning rust is not is not any of those things. So what I got is I have this this card that acts as a pass through for a lot of power that has buttons on the back and I can turn hard drives on and off. So I've got one in there and it works. Windows only recently enabled the ability to have to to do the functionality for that. It's called hot swapping. It, it literally didn't exist earlier, which which was really sad to learn. So, but it works now. And so I could actually plug in uh, another however many hard drives and have that as backup solutions or have that as you know, my working archive and my backup would be via a dock and then I put it in a in a waterproof box in a fireproof safe is how I uh, that's how I use my on-site backups. I have already looked into off-site backups. I found a, a decent company. Um, it, it costs money and uh, and and actually using that service, it might cost as little as six bucks a month, American. So that's what, 10 Canadian or something like this. Um, but then it depends on how much it gets used so, and, and how, how often you do uploads and how often you do downloads. And an offsite backup like that sounds like it would be the correct thing to do at some point. And maybe, maybe I will do that instead of doing a, a, a second hard drive locally. Maybe that's what I'll do because that might actually save money. That's going to cost more money in the long run, <laughs> but it's going to be more featureful. It's going to be short. It's going to be less money now. It's going to be what? 10 bucks now. Um, so maybe, maybe I'll look into that. Oh, I'll let me make a note of that as well. And they're actually a really cool service. Like if you have, um, a disaster and you need to recover their data, you can actually buy a hard drive from them. And they'll ship you the hard drive with your data and then you can ship it back and they'll refund you. So I presumably it's the cost of shipping times too, which, which is, which is not nothing since they're an American company, right? So, but they'll, they can also do it with a USB stick and, uh, they've got some other really cool corporate things. Uh, I nerded out and looked into the underlying technology and all this kind of stuff. And they're like, yeah, I will send this, this seven, seven bay, uh, network to tax attached storage to you. And you just hook it into your network and, and it works like this. And you plug all the hard drives in here and it has, you know, 12, 12 terabytes per bay. <laughs> and you just copy your stuff up and just ship this box back to us. And we plug it in and your data becomes available very quickly through this specialized device. And I'm like, wow, I like learning about these weird corporate solutions, even though I wouldn't use one of those, not anymore. Um, and actually, I'm, even back in the day, I probably wouldn't because we'd rather imp implement it ourselves. Uh, there's a syndrome, it's called not made here syndrome. And it's, it's this weird, it's a, f it's a fear of dependency on external forces, which is, which is justified but there's certain circumstances where things should be delegated to specialists. So things like offsite backups, eh, you can do it yourself. Um, but sometimes, sometimes you need more stuff, more weird services, and it's better to have, uh, have a solid relationship with a trustworthy third party company. Okay. So, um, so that's stuff for us to work on between now and Sunday and I'll, I will have answers on my end. You will have a couple of items on a to-do list, right? So, um, the iTunes requirements and, um, and uh, doing a little bit of fiddling with the cards maybe for our, our stream. So they line up nicely and to the full timer stuff like this, I could pursue that. And I think it would look a lot better. And that's the iterative improvement between shows. So I th we're, we're running out of time. I'm going to end it a little bit early since I talked over from last segment. So we'll end it a little bit early. So this has been 2020-1007, episode 25. Lucid Indifference, you can find us in our backlog and including just little interesting clips at lucidindifference.com. 
thanks everyone. And I'll see you in uh, a few days on Sunday. Thanks.